Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 3 Consolations of the Souls This contentment in the midst of the most intense sufferings cannot be explained otherwise than by the divine consolations which the Holy Ghost infuses into the souls in purgatory. This divine spirit, by means of faith, hope, and charity, puts them in the disposition of a sick person who has to submit to a very painful treatment, but the effect of which is to restore him to perfect health. This sick person suffers, but he loves the solitary suffering. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, gives a similar contentment to the holy souls. Of this we have striking examples in Peter Miles, raised from the dead by St. Stanislaus of Kharkov, who preferred to return to purgatory rather than to live again upon earth. The celebrated miracle of this resurrection happened in 1070, and is thus related in the Acta Centaurum on May 7th. St. Stanislaus was a bishop of Kharkov when the Duke Bolsilas II governed Poland. He did not neglect to remind this prince of his duties, who scandalously violated them before all his people. Wolsilas was irritated by the holy liberty of the prelate, and to revenge himself he excited against him the heirs of a certain Peter Miles, who had tried three years previously after having sold a piece of ground to the church of Carco. The heirs accused the saint of having usurped the ground without having paid the owner. Stanislaus declared that he had paid for the land, but as the witnesses who should have defended him had been either bribed or intimidated, he was denounced as a usurper of the property of another, and condemned to make restitution. Then, seeing that he had nothing to expect from human justice, he raised his heart to God and received a sudden inspiration. He asked for a delay of three days, promising to make Peter Miles appear in person that he might testify to legal purchase and payment of the lot. They were granted to him in scorn. The saint fasted, watched, and prayed God to take up the defense of his cause. The third day after having celebrated Mass, he went out accompanied by his clergy and many of the faithful to the place where Peter had been interred. By his orders, the grave was open. It contained nothing but bones. He touched them with his crozier, and in the name of him who is the resurrection and the life, he commanded the dead man to rise. Suddenly the bones became united, were covered with flesh, and in the sight of the stupefied people, the dead man was seen to take the bishop by the hand and walk towards the tribunal. Bolesas who his court and his immense crowd of people were awaiting the result of the most lively expectation. Behold, Peter, said the saint of Bolsoas, he comes, prince, to give testimony before you. Interrogate him, he will answer you. It is possible to depict the stupefaction of the duke, of his counselors, and of the whole courts of people. Peter affirmed that he had been paid for the ground, and then turned towards his heirs. He reproached them for having accused this pious prelate against a right of justice. Then he exhorted them to do penance for so grievous a sin. It was thus that iniquity, which believed itself already sure of success, was confounded. Now comes a circumstance which concerns our subject, and to which we wish to refer. Wishing to complete this great miracle of the glory of God, Stanislaus proposed to the deceased that, if he desired to live a few years longer, he would obtain for him this favor from God. Peter replied that he had no such desire. He was in purgatory, but he would rather return thereto immediately and endure its pains than expose himself to damnation in this terrestrial life. He entreated the saint only to beg God to shorten the time of his sufferings, that he might the sooner enter the abode of the blessed. After that, accompanied by the bishop and a vast multitude, Peter returned to his grave, laid himself down, his body fell to pieces, and his bones resumed to the same state in which they had first been found. 
We have reason to believe that this saint soon obtained the deliverance of his soul. That which is the most remarkable in this example, and which should most attract our attention, is that a soul from purgatory, after having experienced the most excruciating torments, prefers the state of suffering to the life of this world. And the reason which he gives for this preference is that in this mortal life we are exposed to the dangers of being lost and incurring eternal damnation. Purgatory, Chapter 4 Location of Purgatory Doctrine of Theologians Catechism of the Council of Trent and St. Thomas Aquinas Although faith tells us nothing definite regarding the location of purgatory, the most common opinion, which most accords with the language of Scripture, and which is the most generally received among theologians, places it in the bowels of the earth, not far from hell of the reprobates. Theologians are almost unanimous, says Bellarmine, in teaching that purgatory, at least the ordinary place of expiation, is situated in the interior of the earth, that the souls in purgatory and the reprobate are in the same subterranean space, in the deep abyss which the scripture calls hell. When we say in the Apostles' Creed that after his death Jesus Christ descended into hell, the name hell, says the Catechism of the Council of Trent, signifies those hidden places where the souls are detained, which have not yet reached eternal beatitude. But these prisons are of different kinds. One is dark and gloomy dungeon, where the damned are continually tormented by evil spirits and by a fire which is never extinguished. This place, which is hell properly so called, is also named Gehenna and Abyss. There is another hell which contains the fire of purgatory, there the souls of the just suffer a certain time, that they may become entirely purified before being admitted to their heavenly fatherland, which nothing defiled can ever enter. A third hell was that into which the souls of the saints who died before the coming of Jesus Christ were received, and in which they enjoyed peaceful repose, exempt from pain, consoled and sustained by the hope of their redemption. They were those souls who awaited Jesus Christ in Abraham's bosom, and which were delivered when Christ descended into hell. Our Savior suddenly diffused among them a brilliant light, which filled them with infinite joy and gave them a sovereign beatitude, which is the vision of God. Then was fulfilled the promise of Jesus to the good thief, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. A very probable opinion, says St. Thomas, and one which moreover corresponds with the words of the saints in particular revelation, is that purgatory has a double place for expiation. The first will be destined for the generality of souls, and is situated below, near to hell, the second will be for particular cases, and it is from thence that so many apparitions occur. The Holy Doctor admits, then like so many others who share his opinions, that sometimes divine justice assigns a special place of purification to certain souls, and even permits them to appear either to instruct the living or to procure for the departed the suffrages for which they stand in need sometimes also for other motives worthy of the wisdom and mercy of God. Since we are not writing a controversial treatise, we add neither proofs nor refutations. These can be seen in authors such as Suarez and Bellarmine. We will content ourselves by remarking that the opinion concerning a subterranean hell has nothing to fear from modern science. A science purely natural is incompetent in questions which belong, as this one does, to the supernatural order. Moreover, we know that spirits may be in a place occupied by bodies, as though these bodies did not exist. Whatever, then, the interior of the earth may be, 
whether it may be entirely a fire, as geologists commonly say, or whether it be in any other state, there is nothing to prevent its serving as a subjourn of spirits, even of spirits clothed with a risen body. The Apostle St. Paul teaches us that the air is filled with a multitude of evil spirits. We have to combat, says he, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. Ephesians 6.12 On the other hand, we know that the good angels who protect us are no less numerous in the world. Now if angels and other spirits can inhabit our atmosphere whilst the physical body is not in the least degree changed, why cannot the souls of the dead dwell in the bosom of the earth? Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 5 Consolations of Souls, the Blessed Virgin The souls in purgatory receive also great consolation from the Blessed Virgin. Is she not the consolation of the afflicted? And what affliction can be compared to that of the poor souls? Is she the mother of mercy? And is it not towards these suffering souls that she must show all the mercy of her heart? We must not, therefore, be astonished that in the revelations of St. Bridget, the Queen of Heaven gives herself the beautiful name of Mother of the Souls in Purgatory. I am, she said to the saint, the mother of all those who are in the place of expiation. My prayers mitigate their chastisements which are inflicted upon them for their faults. On October 25, 1604, in the College of Society of Jesus at Cumbria, Father Jerome Valho died in the odor of sanctity at the age of 50 years. This admirable and humble servant of God felt a lively apprehension of the sufferings of purgatory. Neither the cruel machinations which he inflicted upon himself several times every day not counting those prompted each week by the remembrance of the Passion, nor the six hours which he devoted morning and evening to the meditation of the holy subject, seemed sufficient in his estimation to shield him from the chastisement which he imagined awaited him after his death. But one day the Queen of Heaven, to whom he had a tender devotion, condescended herself to console her servant by the simple assurance that she was a mother of mercy, to her dear children in purgatory as well of those upon the earth. Seeking later to spread this consoling doctrine, the holy man accidentally let fall, in the order of his discourse, these words, She told me this herself. It is related that a great servant of Mary, Blessed Rainier of Chiteau, trembled at the thought of his sins and the terrible justice of God after death. In his fear, addressing himself to his great protectress, who calls herself Mother of Mercy, he was wrapped in spirit, and saw the Mother of God supplicating her son in his favor. My son, she said, deal mercifully with him in his purgatory, because he humbly repents of his sins. My mother replied, Jesus, I place his cause in your hands, which meant to say, be it done to your quiet according to your desire. Blessed Rainier understood with unutterable joy that Mary had obtained his exemption from purgatory. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 6 Consolations of Purgatory The Blessed Virgin Mary, Privilege of Saturday it is especially on certain days that the Queen of Heaven exercises her mercy in purgatory. These privileged days are, first, all Saturdays, then the different feasts of the Blessed Virgin, which thus become as festivals in purgatory. We see the revelations of the saints that on Saturday, the day especially consecrated to the Blessed Virgin, the sweet Mother of Mercy descends into the dungeons of purgatory to visit and console her devoted servants. Then, according to her pious belief of the faithful, she delivers those souls who have worn the holy scapular, enjoy the Sabbatine privilege, and afterwards gives relief and consolation to the other souls who had been particularly devout to her. 
A witness to this was the Venerable Sister Paula of St. Teresa, a Dominican religious of the convent of St. Catherine in Naples. Being wrapped in ecstasy one day and transported in spirit into purgatory, she was quite surprised to find it transformed into a paradise of delights, illuminated by a bright light instead of the darkness which at other times prevailed. While she was wondering what could be the cause of this change, she perceived the Queen of Heaven surrounded by a multitude of angels, to whom she gave orders to liberate those souls who had honored her in a special manner and conduct them to heaven. If such takes place on an ordinary Saturday, we can scarcely doubt that the same occurs the feast days consecrated to the Mother of God. Among her festivals, that of the glorious Assumption of Mary seems to be the chief day of deliverance. St. Peter Damien tells us that each year, on the day of the Assumption, the Blessed Virgin delivers several thousands of souls. The following account of a miraculous vision illustrates the subject. It is a pious custom, he says, which exists among the people of Rome to visit the churches, carrying a candle in hand, during the night preceding the feast of the Assumption of Our Lady. Now it happened that a person of rank, being on her knees in the Basilica of the Araceli in the capital, saw before her, prostrate in prayer, another lady, her godmother, who had died several months previous. Surprised and not being able to believe her eyes, she wished to solve the mystery and for this purpose placed herself near the door of the church. As soon as she saw the lady go out, she took her by the hand and draw her aside. Are you not, she said to her, my godmother who held me at that baptismal font? Yes, replied the apparition immediately, it is I. And how comes that I find you among the living, since you have been dead more than a year? Until this day I have been plunged in a dreadful fire on account of many sins of vanity which I committed in my youth. But during this great solemnity, the Queen of Heaven descended into the midst of the purgatorial flames and delivered me, together with a large number of other souls, that we might enter heaven on the feast of her assumption. She exercises this great act of clemency each year, and on this occasion alone, the number of those whom she has delivered equals the population of Rome. Seeing that her daughter remained stupefied and seemed still to doubt the evidence of her sense, the apparition added, In proof of the truth of my words, know that you yourself will die in a year, hence, on the Feast of the Assumption. If you outlive that period, believe that this was an illusion. St. Peter Damien concluded this recital by saying that the young lady passed one year in the exercise of good works in order to prepare herself to appear before God. The year following, on the vigil of the Assumption, she fell sick and died on the day of the feast itself, as had been predicted. The Feast of the Assumption is, then, the greatest day of Mary's mercy towards the poor souls. She delights to introduce her children into the glory of heaven on the anniversary of the day on which she herself entered its blessed portals. This pious belief, adds Father Levet, is founded on a great number of particular revelations. It is for this reason that in Rome, the Church of St. Mary in Monteiro, which is the center of the Arch Confraternity for the Sufferings for the Dead, is dedicated under the title of the Assumption.